cannot have escaped your attention that there is a small contingent of our nation that poses a threat to our way of life. They want us to stop farming our most prized delicacy on the grounds of their moral concerns. We must not let them push us around. As you well know, it has always been an important part of our culture. Why should we assume that this small group of radicals have got it right and that our ancestors have all been wrong? Think of all the memories we've shared when eating the meat around the table with our families. It is a wonderful thing. Secondly, I have yet to come across anyone who doesn't gain great satisfaction from the delicious taste of the meat. Whether it is in patties, ground mints or slices, it is enjoyed by billions every day. Imagine the backlash if we showed sympathy to the radicals. Think about all the businesses that rely on the meat for their income. It would be political suicide. Finally, and most importantly, we must always remember the natural order of things. We are top of the food chain, and it is our right to exercise our dominion. Every test we have conducted on the creatures have proven them to be inferior, be it intelligence, strength, or a capacity to live what we'd all say is a fulfilling life. I know that you must feel the same. All I ask is for permission to deal with the radicals. Eating human meat should never be up for debate. Hello and welcome to episode 99 of the Pan Psycast. I'm the utilitarian counting everybody for one, but nobody for more than one, Mr. Jack Symes. And I'm joined once again by the Aristotelian slave owner who treats animals as mere instruments. It's Mr. Ollie Marley. Hello. And the Kantian who only refrains from kicking dogs because he doesn't want to hurt himself. It's Mr. <laughs> Andrew Orton. Hello. <laughs> this is very exciting. It's the first time in all of 2021 we've been able to to see each other we haven't seen each other in ages and we've got to speak about the elephant in the room ollie you're looking fantastic (laughs) (laughs) why is that an elephant in the room i always look fantastic i think it's the the fedora maybe that's like a nice little is that something you've adopted during lockdown yes i adopted many new fashion styles and now wear a fedora a pink blazer and a cravat at all times. With those feather earrings as well. Yep, I've got to make sure that as many animals suffered in the making of my clothes as possible. <laughs> well, I'm glad you've done your research <laughs> properly. <laughs> uh, just a quick update and a message to thank everyone who started supporting us on Patreon. Every time we see a new name pop up, you take us one step closer to the Sun and Bonham or, or Udomania. As we're now without our episode sponsors, we need you to help keep the show on the air. We're getting closer to our target of 200 patrons by episode 100. That's next episode. So please, if you're yet to pledge your support, hit the link in the iTunes description. Over on the Patreon, you'll get early access to all of our episodes, including this full series. You can get yourself a beautiful Pansycast mug, access to our monthly live Q&As and episode shout outs. To thank everybody for their support, we've recently produced three exclusive Patreon episodes exploring the show behind the scenes as we approach episode 100, the first of which is already out. So hit the link in the iTunes description or go to patreon.com forward slash Pansycast. Go on, there's nothing else going on. It's not like we're about to, I don't know, break into song. (laughs) (laughs) Ali Mali, how you thrill me. Uh Uh Ali Mali, Ali Mali, nearly kill me. Uh Uh Ali Mali, Uh Ali Mali, we've heard about you before. And we wanted to know some more. And now I know what they mean. You're like nose explosion machine. (laughs) Oh, you make Make me me dizzy. That was brilliant. That was pretty good, actually. I'm quite impressed. <laughs> As you know, today is National Sewing Machine Day, a time to <laughs> honour an invention that's kept us in stitches for over 150 oh, years. God. The invention of the sewing machine laid the fabric of today's booming clothing industry and sowed the seeds of the garments that keep us looking on fleek, i.e. very stylish, today. <laughs> Ollie, as someone who is always looking tip-top, do you have any top tips for keeping a fine and dandy wardrobe? Three tips. <laughs> so specific. <laughs> Three tips. This is going to be for the gentleman, more because obviously because I am one. Uh, number one, wear a waistcoat at pretty much every social occasion you can do. They're like a shirt jacket, but cooler. So if you get really warm in the summer, you can still look stylish and keep cool. Uh, number two, don't feel restricted by the tie. You can have a bow tie. 
You can have a cravat. You can have just a normal tie. These these things are malleable. They're flexible. Don't feel like you've just got to wear your normal standard tie. Mm. Every and feel free to take it off too. I mean, like you know, if it's a bit hot outside. And my third and final tip is never have black trousers and brown shoes. Oh, wow. that is a sin. You shouldn't is do it? that. Real, real bad. Yeah. Oh, I, I look really stupid now. I'm doing uh, none of that. I haven't got a waistcoat on. No, I'm wearing black trousers, brown shoes. Yeah. What's the middle one again? To oh, don't mix it up with the tie. Yeah, yeah. yeah a bit of flexibility with the tie. I like in your bow tie there, Jay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Too bad it's on your wrist. <laughs> it's on my head like a little. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we haven't had a listener question in a while. Do you fancy one? Sure. Hello. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Hello. Is there somebody there? Listener questions with Jack and Andy and Ollie. Listener questions with Jack and Andy and Ollie. Listener questions with Jack and Andy and Ollie. But Greg might be there. But Greg might be there as well. Hello? It's episode 99. We'll, <laughs> we'll treat you to that one. That's for the old school fans. If you didn't enjoy that... You know how to turn off the podcast. Uh, our question is from Cameron Treese in the United States. He directs his question at me, but I'm going to open it to, to the group because I'm not sure why it was. Well, I don't know how Cameron's going to feel <laughs> like, about that. I have Jack. the authority yeah. when choosing the episode. I think Andrew chooses most of the topics these days, so we'll direct it <laughs> at Andrew. He says, Jack, would you consider a podcast on the philosophy of Paul Tillich? My answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Andrew, do you want to? Have a go? Uh, I mean, my answer is we already have. Um, <laughs> admittedly, not to a great extent, but when when we did the episode on religious language, we talked a bit about Tillich and symbols. I think we could have done that a little bit more merit and and looked at it in more depth. So maybe that's something that we could go back to, not specifically religious language, but some of the other things around that. But we also talked about Tillich, if if, uh, listeners haven't been made aware or don't know that we did a whole series of episodes on Christian Thor, and that is as a standalone separate podcast that you can search for. And one of the episodes to do with that, we talk about Tillich's philosophy mm. and some of his ideas about the ground of being and his views of God. And so we've we've done a bit there. So would we do a full episode on Tillich and Christian existentialism? Not for a, a long time. But it might be something that it no, could we're be. We're never going to be doing that. We, d- we, we tell everybody say, we'll do I'll the episode. I'll never episodes. say never here. Well, me but, not, but it's I, not I, on the list like of things. I'm going to say never. And I'm going to say, Cameron, if you really like some Tillich and some pan psychast in your life, go to our website, look for the audio book. It's called Developments in Christian Thought. Find the chapter that has got Paul Tillich connected to it and give that a listen. And that will fulfill your Tillich urge because I don't think we're going to do it anytime soon. We could do religious language for episode 100. Well, we couldn't. That'd be good too. <laughs> yeah. It's it. Paul Tillich, episode 100. So this installment that you're listening to now marks the first in our four-part series on animal rights. It's a topic we discuss in the after show quite a lot in the form of the iconic vegan corner. But in this series, we're really going to the heart of the jungle, the bottom of the ocean, and to the streets of Königsberg. That's where can't lift a few. Did know we'll be, be looking at the place of non-human animals within the history of philosophy in this week's. Next week we'll be looking at the metaphysics and logic of speciesism and whether or not that's a meaningful term and moral responsibilities towards our fellow creatures as well and whether we have them. In part three we'll be discussing the place of non-human animals in contemporary society and in part four we'll be getting into some of the technical details. Is it ever permissible to eat meat? Should we protest against animal experimentation? Should we visit zoos? keep pets stroke cats or place our faith in god i don't want to give anything away but jesus did eat fish and ride a donkey i'm going to give something away and say you can stroke a cat i think that's okay in most cases leave that one till part four (laughs) that is quite contentious i'll have you know it actually is if you've read the literature ollie you'd know (laughs) andrew this was another one of your picks and a brilliant one at that tell us uh what was your inspiration and did you enjoy the fruits of your farming. <laughs> um, when you say that this was my pick, it's just well, I've become some sort of tyrant who always pushes his agenda. Um, this was actually one of five books that I, I, I say books, uh, what, five topics that I put up for suggestion because nobody else was giving us any ideas. So, <laughs> apart from all the listeners that write to us all the time, but, and thank you for them. Keep the suggestions yeah, coming. Yeah, go, yeah, yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, and then. Everybody voted on it, and we came up, we settled on Christine Korsgaard's Other Creatures, 
as as a, like a starting point and of course we've gone and read other texts for this and and so it became an episode not just on that text but on animals and and our treatment of animals and animal rights and all of that stuff uh, across the series yeah it's, it's something as you've already said we've talked about it a decent amount uh it's something that we are all interested in and care about and i hope that when we do this that we do it justice and that we avoid being too preachy if that does come across sorry it's not actually what i intend or hope to do for this episode and I'm, I'm hoping that we we look at it and we do it as fairly as possible i don't think we're, we'll come across as preachy i think like any of the topics that we we look at we do them all justice we'll give the arguments we'll outline the history of the thought we'll give our own thoughts in further analysis and discussion but there won't just be like our beliefs or like things like that there'll be what we think of the content we've discussed and we'll all pick each other up if we think we're being intellectually dishonest as we always do annoyingly to each other all the time anyway Ollie, did you enjoy your preparation? Did you manage to read anything other than Aristotle? <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Yeah, this is a really big topic. And this is going to be an introduction to animal rights and animal ethics, right? So don't worry if you've never come across any of this stuff before. You don't know who Peter Singer is or who even Cause Guard is that Andy mentioned earlier. If you've never heard of these thinkers, do not worry. We're going to explain who they are, explain what speciesism is, explain all of this stuff in, in detail so you, you've got a good footing. And I think we need to be aware that our audience is going to be coming to this episode in lots of different ways. There may be members of our audience that are very much into animal rights and ethics already. There might be members that have literally never heard of it before. And I, as someone who didn't really know very much, I knew a little bit, having been friends with you two for a long time, it has had a massive impact on my life over the last few months. And mm. I think that I hope that it has a big impact on other people's and being more aware of this topic and this issue from a philosophical perspective is very useful. One of my favourite philosophers, only joking, I don't really like him very much, Karl Marx said, right, the point of philosophy isn't just to interpret the world, it's to change it. And I think that this is certainly an episode where if sometimes you think philosophy is very much in the sky, people just sat in their armchairs philosophising. This is a type of philosophy that has a very clear, practical element to mm. it that I think our audience is really going to enjoy and really engage with. We should preface the episode with two things. The first one being a trigger warning in that so much of the content we're going to be discussing will be upsetting to people who don't have like an absolutist approach to non-human animal uh, suffering. So if you think if you think you would find it difficult to hear about a cat like being punched or being stabbed or being skinned, that kind of stuff. If that triggers you in some way, then there are going to be things like that throughout this episode, which are hard to listen to. But we will not be discussing them to inspire emotions in you, to make you upset, to make you do a certain thing. We're using them to illustrate the situation in part three in particular, the place of non-human animals in contemporary society. It is impossible to discuss this topic without talking about animal suffering. And to do animal suffering justice, you need to talk about what actually happens to animals. And for a lot of people, that is very upsetting. So if animal suffering you find upsetting, yeah, we are going to talk about it in detail. Hmm. And we also have come to this topic often from our deeply entrenched views. Everyone has a perspective already on the question of vegetarianism and, and the environmental impact of the things that they eat. And I like this uh, quote from Mary Midgley from her book, uh, Animals and Why They Matter. She says, to himself, the meat eater seems to be eating life. To the vegetarian, he seems to be eating death. There is a kind of a gestalt shift between the two positions, which makes it hard to change and hard to raise questions on the matter at all without becoming embattled. And and on that point, um, I was reading the art, the art of logic by Eugenia Cheng a while ago, and she she talks about when looking at arguments and setting out a logical case is often enough if the p starting positions of people and their preconceptions are radically different, as you pointed out there with Midgley's quotation, is that you can sometimes just no matter what evidence or whatever arguments are presented, is that you're still going to find they're going to be very radically different opposing views on this topic. Mm. I guess, see where the logic takes you. There will be certain things that even when we're arguing a case, there will still be issues with it and criticize the ideas and think about it carefully. That's all I'd say. Just a final note, we have a new editor on the show, the brilliant Tyler Hislop, but I'm editing this one, having not done so for several months. So apologies if my timing's off slightly. Part one, history. So in this installment, we're going to be talking about 
all the different strands of thought leading up to the 20th century. Obviously, we can't cover them all, but we're going to be looking at some of the main themes, things that you need to know to engage with the contemporary debate regarding animal rights. Like this quote from Mary Midgley to kick us off, the animal question has been rather neglected by philosophers till quite lately, but when you look into it, it raises a host of large and interesting questions. Questions of like identity and consciousness and rights and language, of contract theory, of moral philosophy, and we're going to be touching on all of those themes in this week's instalment. One very small preliminary, we, and when I say we, we're talking about human beings, homo sapiens, when we say animals, we're going to be referring to non-human animals as animals. Obviously, homo sapiens are animals as well, but it would be really clunky of us to constantly say non-human animals as we're going through this series. So forgive us, you might accuse us of being speciesist, but we're going to be saying animals rather than non-human animals, just for the sake of not taking too much of your time with unnecessary <laughs> words. And probably I've taken probably more you, time yeah, you, by explaining. <laughs> You're wasting my time here, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> and in the popular mind, we're not going to set out the metaphysics and the and the sufficient conditions for being what an animal is in this instalment. But we should again note that the term animal brings together everything from oysters to great apes. So it's a really broad term. But with those preliminaries out of the way, uh, should we jump into uh, what is the the history of thought of non-human animals? And do you want to kick us off (laughs) with... um... Yeah, I thought the a nice place to start here is actually just to give a quick little look at some of the things that we'll be talking about throughout the rest of this episode, because most of the history of thought on animals has been about how, if not to justify why we treat animals differently to humans, just different ways of separating humanity from the animal kingdom and talking about how our relationships between us as a community matters more about than the to us than the relationship that we have with the rest of the animal world. And so Christine Korsgaard in her book, uh, uh, Fellow Creatures, highlights a couple of things, the key things that come up when we talk about the reasons why people treat animals differently. And I just wanted to highlight these first because a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about in this episode come under these headings. So the first one she gives is what's called moral standing. I'm just going to give her a quick definition of this. She says, having moral standing is usually thought of as having some property that makes you an appropriate object of direct or or, or an intrinsic moral concern. And so those could be things like rationality or consciousness or sentience. So there's a whole bunch of array of different things. And it, the claim is, if you have this thing, now you're part of moral concern. People should think carefully about how you treat you. Mm-hmm. And what we'll look at then is, is that some people will say animals lack a particular thing, mm-hmm. which means that they don't have to be part of moral concern. So that comes up quite often. It could be that animals have different needs. So maybe they are part of moral concern, but not to the same extent as humans so we won't have to worry about how we treat them in certain ways and i think that's quite a common thing that uh, is still very prevalent our relationships are very different so human beings can have social contracts or actual contracts that they sign with one another and that it is is part of a very important part of our moral relationships with one another that, that these contracts are respected and then finally she says that there is a difference when it comes to things like self-defense so if a rat comes into my home and i think it's a threat to my health then maybe I have grounds to kill that rat because I'm afraid that I I might suffer because of its presence. Mm. Should we start off at the <laughs> start off the beginning? Start off with the the ancient world religions. Yeah, I will. Let's start with Christianity. We cannot overemphasize the importance of Christian views towards animals on society at large, especially in the West. Christianity has a, to we say, complicated relationship with animals, I think to put it lightly. So if we go back to the scriptures, if we want to go back to Bible Corner, we can look in the book of Genesis. This is where the vast majority of Christians get their interpretation of how we should treat animals. Mm. And Genesis has things to say about how we should treat animals, mainly referring to this phrase we're going to use called dominion. So mm. let's take a little quote from the King James Version I hear, Jack. It's your favorite version of the Bible. It certainly is. So we're going to verse 28 here. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Adam and Eve, just uh, for context here, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and every other living thing that creepeth upon the earth. Mm. There's two elements to this, isn't it? Is the human beings are separated from this and they are made in God's image. This gives human beings a, a very special role. And that, domi- that element of dominion involves control and power over these creatures. 
This has been interpreted in in a couple of different ways, but I think it's typically been used as as a way to say that yes, it is okay to eat animals and it is okay to farm them and it is okay to use them for work and all sorts of things. And all of those things need not have to be in the way that things are being done right now. They, a lot of the people in the society who, like when these stories were first being passed around, would have been very loose agricultural societies. Yeah, and I think even Dominion itself has lots of interpretations, doesn't it? We can, we can, I think we can say with confidence throughout most of history, people have just taken it as you can pretty much do whatever you want with an animal within reason, as long as you don't torture it or treat it cruelly. You can use its skin for fur, you can eat it, you can use them for productive means. A more generous reading, a more modern reading, you could say a lot of Christians would use this word stewardship instead. That you actually should care for animals and care for their concerns mm. too. But there is this distinction. Animals are not humans. And this very clearly comes down to the idea that humans are created in God's image and humans have a soul, right? There is something different and distinct about the human experience. We have souls. We're made in the image of God. We're imbued with this relationship with God. As far as we know, God doesn't want to have a relationship with animals, but he does want to have a relationship with us. So I know that some people like to interpret the Genesis accounts of there's no suffering or bloodshed in the Garden of Eden before the fall, before the original sin. But it's quite clear when they're banished from the, the garden that God sends them out in animal skins. Even if you thought in the Garden of Eden that they weren't killing animals, it seems like animals have a different role after the fall, or if you thought they didn't could in the Garden of Eden, then they have the same role. And we find the same when, when, when God speaks to Noah on his return, and he says, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. And we see lots of animal sacrifice in the Old Testament. We do have uh, kosher laws, which try and reduce the suffering of animals. <laughs> Is this too oversimplistic? That you can use non-human animals for as a means to improving one's life as a human being. You have permission from God, but unnecessary suffering should be avoided as described in the kosher laws. Not just that, Jack. But the very idea that Christians would say, actually, one of the reasons animals exist at all is for our use. They are commodities, something useful that we can use to enhance our lives and make them better. Right. This is different to the Old Testament view, right? I think Singer talks about this in his book. He says, in the Old Testament, at least you have compassion for non-human animals and the kinds of things you're allowed to do to them. But the New Testament is completely void of that. And he cites the example of Jesus when he gets those demons out of the people and throws them towards the, the swine, the pigs. Yeah. So and Augustine says, that's a clear indication that Jesus could have just let them fly into the air. But he's showing us there in that miracle that pigs don't matter. I want, yeah, I wanted to bring up Augustine there, where he, because he, he, for if you, those of you who are unfamiliar with Augustine and his background, he spent about, I believe it's nine years of his life as part of a particular group called the Manichees. And the Manichees practice, uh, particularly the people who were strictly Manichaean, would practice vegetarianism. Uh, and while he was a Manichee, he wasn't uh, one, uh, of that ilk. But anyway, he was part of that tradition, and then he mm. begins to reject it. And as he becomes an actual bishop and is in, interested in writing against these doctrines, is he says that the Manichees are wrong, and he needs to prove why. And he, and he does mention Jesus, and he, he says that Jesus never harmed another human being, but we can see examples of him harming animals and have no guilt about it whatsoever. Mm. And so clearly human beings are seen as these people that are a deep concern and love for God, but animals do not fit into that category whatsoever. Whatsoever. And just a quotation here from Augustine. It is by a very just ordainment of the Creator that they, animals, have been subordinated for our use. And that says it all, really. He's appealing to Genesis, he's, he's adding Jesus into the mix, and God does not care for animals in the same way. That doesn't mean that animals are bad. I mean, if you look at Augustine's wider view on his theology is that mm. everything is good in its own place. So God must, in fact, love all, all, of, all of creation. But that doesn't mean that we can't make distinctions according to him. We're obviously aware that not all Christians think this, and we've had David Clough on the show, and there's been a modern reform in, in Christian thought to think that we do have moral responsibilities towards non-human animals. But is this a good time to move towards the absolute dismissal view then, the view that using non-human animals raises no ethical concerns whatsoever? Should we move into that camp? Yeah, I think probably the best philosopher, quote unquote best, to look at this is Rene Descartes. And we've done an episode before. If you want to check it out, please do. It's one we're very proud of. And we do actually talk a little bit about animals in that episode as well, if you want to know some 
very, very detailed stuff. So Descartes was a Christian, so he believes that human beings have a soul and that animals do not have a soul. And that soul for Descartes interacts with the body in a very specific way. He uses the word mechanistic to explain animals. So because they don't have this soul, this kind of like energy source to them, even though they might appear to suffer, even though they might appear hungry, sad, happy, these are just mechanistic representations almost of something that doesn't exist. It's not the same thing as a human being in pain or suffering or happy. And because of that, he ultimately, without kind of sugarcoating it too much, says you can pretty much treat an animal any way you want. And was very famous in his own time for performing live vivisection. So if you don't know what that means, that's when you cut open an animal and operate on it while it's still alive. And there's lots of examples of him sharing letters with other scientists of having a live vivisection on a pregnant cow just to see how the fetus would develop, which is pretty gross. I think most of us would agree at a very late stage of its development as well, which is, again, a little bit icky. And also performing live vivisections on bunny rabbits as well to figure out how their biology and physiology worked. And again, the way he would justify this is even he would have students that would say, you know, Rene, come on, like this, this, this rabbit screaming, this cow's in large amounts of pain. Mm. And he would say, no, it looks like it's in pain. You know, it might sound like it's screaming, but these are just mechanisms. It's just like the squeaking of gears or, you know, the noise your car makes when you turn it to the left. Yeah. It's, it's not the same thing as a human being suffering. And there's some horrific accounts, aren't there, of people visiting either Descartes or his followers, laboratories in which you've got accounts of, of dogs who are all four of their paws nailed to a board, they've got it open and they're poking it and people who are upset or protest, they laugh at because obviously they don't understand the the. the the philosophy behind uh, the fact that non-human animals don't suffer. Yeah, and he was seen as a pioneer of vivisection. He was seen as like a, a really, you know, helping the hum humanity get better and understanding the world around you. And I, I guess a lot of us, you know, we would say, you know, science is a good thing and we, we would encourage us to learn about the world around us, but not by causing large amounts of pain to other life forms. I think most of us would probably get off the boat when it came to that. Well, I'm, I'm not going to defend Descartes' position here, but one thing I did want to bring up, which I, I found quite interesting, is that apparently Descartes, in some of his writings, does talk about animals as having sensations and feelings and emotions and that yeah he could he can't justify the language he's using because he's already committed to this dualism and the fact that animals apparently cannot suffer they are autonomous as we've already said but we know as well and we i think jack you mentioned this in the episode that we did on descartes is mm. that he he himself had a dog monsieur gret <laughs> he loved that dog <laughs> Now, it's weird that we, and perhaps we've been using this term on some of the later episodes as well, is this weird, but well, I'm not sure if he had much cognitive dissonance, but this, this sense that you could have a dog that you love and you care for and respect, yet do the same thing to, like, to do these vivisections on other dogs and not think about how this might affect the animal. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know enough about how Descartes felt about his own personal dog to make any more comment than that but i thought that's an interesting thing to think about i agree with andy though i also think it's quite fascinating that you can have a man who's literally cutting up animals alive looking at their very complex nervous systems and that it wouldn't have occurred to him that oh this might be like the nervous system of a human being maybe there's a, a correlation there a connection there even today there are people that say you know mammals vertebrates fish don't feel pain the same way human beings do where a lot of the science since then has very much gone in the direction that no if if you if you punch a dog, the dog is going to feel pain the same way you would feel if you got punched because it has a nervous system just like you do. Another of the 17th century rationalists, Spinoza, had a very similar view to Descartes. Well, the conclusion of his view being that the suffering of animals just didn't matter. And here's a quote from him. It is plain that the laws against slaughtering of animals is founded rather on vain superstition and womanish pity than on sound reasoning. Ooh. And a biographer of Spinoza tells us that Spinoza was interested in insects, but he used to often, quote, find some spiders and let them fight with one another. Or he would find some flies, throw them in the spider's web and watch this battle with great pleasure, even with laughter. I think that captures how Spinoza thought and did act, performing vivisections, making these insects fight and getting some kind of joy out of it as well. There seems something like evil. Some like, kind of web of personality on here, Jack. And we see this tradition alive and well in the form of the behaviorist today. And behaviorism, quite a, a modern and, and sophisticated view, one might think, is that you can explain the nature of an animal simply by appealing to its behavior, what it does, how it acts, how it reacts to stimuli, without having to appeal to the mental states, the inner states of the animal. Again, if you ask like a, 
a behaviorist to actually like cut open a puppy or something that it seems like the behaviorist model is one to approach understanding the animal from the perspective of science rather than an actual philosophical position they would hold in the their their day-to-day life you might think Uh, and here's a nice quote from Midgley on something similar if we ask an Indian farmer whether the ox which he beats can feel he'd say certainly it can otherwise why would I bother so belief in their sentience is essential for exploiting them in some sense or training them in some way And, and behaviorism seems to be a model and Susan Blackmore spoke about this in her interview with us philosophers of mind rarely if ever appeal to behaviorism as a way of explaining the mind of us and other creatures well, and, and nor do i think the psychology community look at behaviorism as as an explanation for how behavior functions in its entirety yeah so i, I don't know how popular be- strict behaviorism is these days i i don't think it is at all there's a really famous quotation from voltaire talking about uh, the cartesians and the and the people performing these vivisections i won't give the entire quotation but he, he starts off by saying Look at these human beings who are uh, who are treating these dogs in a particular way. And then he says, uh, uh, answer me this mechanist. Did nature arrange all the apparatus of sensation in this animal in order that it should feel nothing? Does it have nerves in order to be without sensation? Do not suppose this kind of incongruence contradiction in nature. So he's saying if animals have all the apparatus that we do to have nerves and sensations, the fact that nature doesn't like make mistakes in that sense it's a very big claim to say that if they have these things that they somehow lack the ability to feel pain Mm. and i think that says it all really isn't it it's like once you understand or you don't even have to understand the complexities of anatomy you just need to know the basics to know that there should be at least a similar process happening here now that again does not mean that all animals share exactly the same processes nor do they feel pain in the same way but it's enough to to raise an eyebrow to say the least let us pause for a moment to say a quick thank you to all our animal loving patrons reducing suffering at patreon.com forward slash pansycast for supporting the show in particular a very special thank you to the man who enjoys fresh air unlike animals it's mr adam cool he pities the fool who tests makeup on animals it's mr t He's not a vegan, he's a very naughty boy. It's the life of Brian. Ramirez. She's jumping through hoops to save badgers. It's Lily Hooper. He's not St. Francis of Assisi, but he still talks to animals. It's Saint David Legeness. Left breathless by appalling factory farming conditions. It's Jamie Lunn. The mechanic who only takes the wheels off the trucks that take animals to slaughter. It's Jay Wheelless. If you want to stop suffering, vote Pedro. <laughs> And the man whose name is more unknowable than why fox hunting is still legal in the UK. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. It is, yeah. It is. Serious? Wow. It it's is. more on <laughs> <laughs> If you're enjoying the show, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into the discussion. The popular view is that there's something it's like to be these creatures, as Thomas Nagel puts it. (laughs) The kennel worker assumes the dog is anxious when they're put into an unfamiliar setting. We think the stray dog is feeling hunger when they search for food. We think that when the pig is forced into the gas chamber, their squealing shows us their their feeling or their distress. So we we think of these things in our day-to-day life. And Immediately talks about this in her book again of how this is not like a symbol or something. It's it's not something we can just leave aside. The consciousness is a thing. It's a fact about the world that we have to recognize to have a complete theory of animals. And I forget what her quip is, but she says something really funny as if like, you know, all these examples of the kennel worker and the ox trainer and the circus trainer and people who have pets or, or companions, companion animals. She's like as if a, one quick stroke of a metaphysician would rule out the fact that these things can have feelings when every day we recognize recognize them in our interactions with them when we cross the species barriers we play with the dog for example and we infer things about its mental states but in the same way the problem of the minds i don't know if you two have conscious experiences you have a similar apparatus than me and as voltaire's quote puts it really nicely as you sums it up there it seems that if they have similar behavior if they have a similar physiology then we should infer something similar and maybe it's just wielding like Occam's razor and slicing things too quickly or firing Morgan's cannon. Don't attribute <laughs> yeah. too many too many mental states you need to explain them a little bit too uh, quickly. Yeah. And, I, I and as, as you've, you've said there, I think, I think if something appears to be in great pain, 
you should at least act with caution. Like, assume that the pain is in fact real rather than coming up with some metaphysical explanation for why it only appears to be real. Mm. Because if you're wrong, then the cost of being wrong is an awful lot higher than if you're correct. Mm. So we've begun with talking about lots of absolutist views about animals, that they don't have moral value. We don't need to think about them when we're devising our moral system whatsoever or living our everyday lives. We can use them for whatever use we like, just as we use a car or a laptop or a plane. We can fly on a bird. We can <laughs> ride on a donkey. <laughs> now, we're going to explore some of the more relative approaches here that say non-human animals have some kind of value, or maybe they do have value, but they're further down the pecking order than human beings. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks for that pun. Uh, the, yeah, I, I'm, I wanted to bring in David Hume. Now we've, we've talked about a couple of Enlightenment philosophers, and Hume argues that our duties of justice to certain things, so usually people, mm. rely mm. on a relationship in which there is some reciprocation and that there is some power dynamic which is on the whole, if not equal, close to that. So if I ask somebody to do something and they say no, then if I had complete authority over them, if I told, well, if I wouldn't ask, I would just tell them and they would have no, no say but to do what I tell them to do. And he thinks that a society of justice involves people not being able to completely do that and that people then have rights and should be protected from, from that kind of treatment. Hmm. Whereas if the power dynamic is completely the way in which it is with, say, human beings and animals, is that animals can never ask of us anything. They can't put us under any demands. Mm -hmm. And nor if we like wanted to try and listen to them, could they offer that in any way? So he seems to think then that humanity is bound by the, the kind of laws of humanity, as in treating them nicely because right. it's nice to do. That's more of a generous thing we offer but should we treat them as part of an equal part of a society where we we consider their rights mm -hmm. no that's not something that he thinks is is part of this reciprocal justice system that he uh, uh, subscribes to yeah as always i've found lots of different interpretations of, of hume when doing the prep for and in that one as well it seems that he's operating with quite a narrow conception of justice in the terms of property and rights and when we use terms like property and rights and a justice we should be skeptical because we it depends what you say those things are. And he's talking quite politically there. But then, as you say, right, he's got that great quote from him, bound by the laws of humanity to give gentle usage to these creatures, he says. So exclusion from justice by no means excludes one from the, the realm of moral philosophy. So perhaps we shouldn't be too eager to commit Hume to a view there, but we definitely can for some of the other political philosophers some of the other contract theorists now john rawls i thought this was a great example because john rawls obviously has the veil of ignorance the original position in which one doesn't know where they're going to be in society imagine you had to set the rules of how society would function not knowing whether you'd be born rich poor uh, educated in an educated family in an atheist family in a religious family you have no idea where in society you're going to end up but he leaves out animals from this and I thought that was, that's quite unusual when you actually reflect on it, because mm. if you're a conscious creature, your consciousness can end up in any of these creatures. Why would you consider animals? Here's a quote from Rawls. Why I have not maintained that the capacity for a sense of justice is necessary in order to be owed the duties of justice. It does seem that we are not required to give strict justice any way to creatures lacking this capacity. So when you read Rawls, you see that yeah, he does think we have compassion. We have responsibilities, compassion, but they don't fit in with the political philosophy's idea of what justice is they're doing a different kind of project i think and they don't fit into that i would like to be a praying mantis in the 15th century i think that'd be <laughs> superb and you can see a little bit of progress here can't you we've got these political philosophers now people like hume not going too far away from like the descartes view obviously they're not going to believe in something like a soul but they're not going full quids in on no animal rights or a thing yet mm. not quite we're, we're still very much on the other okay maybe we could be a little bit better but are, you know, are we the same? No, 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 no. 
So perhaps we should say exactly what contract theory is. So it's saying you've got moral rights and obligations because we've all signed this imaginary contract and it all gives us moral status. Animals can't have moral status because they can't sign the imaginary contract. They lack the agency to agree to the system of morality that we're proposing. So we're in the state of nature and we say, oh, we don't want to kill each other. We'd, life would be solitary, nasty, brutal, and short. So all those people who can hypothetically, tacitly agree to the contract do so. And that's why I shouldn't kill you, why you should can be that's what grounds morality says the contract theorist that's where moral values come from so it's difficult then to see how animals fit into this picture and when i talk to a contract theorist the common response i give is well in a state of nature when you kick a dog in the woods for no reason that seems like it's a morally wrong thing to do so how are you going to account for that and peter carothers tries to give a couple of responses to this he says it might open the door to injustices committed against human beings so the way you treat animals might eventually overlap to people who suffer with severe disabilities and also he says people would be super distressed if you started harming non-rational humans because they, they can't agree to the contract either, right? Not just animals. And people wouldn't like that because right? it would distress them emotionally. So you might not think these are, are brilliant reasons uh, <laughs> for, for thinking that animals shouldn't be considered. Is it really going to open the door to harming humans? Uh, like he says, it's it seems like people would be horrified by that. I'm not sure if you can reconcile these two points he's making. Well, perhaps we'll come back to those specific points later. But yeah, I, I think just a way to summarize the idea of this contract stuff is it's really about what we owe each other mm. and this... And, and, and don't get me wrong, I think this is important, but this element of reciprocation within the ethical tradition. So if you do something to me, I might have the right to do something to you. Or perhaps more positively, knowing that we are all self-interested and that we have goals and desires that we want to fulfill. And I know that my desires, if I reflect on it, are actually absolutely more important than yours mm -hmm. and vice versa. Perhaps we should all work towards a way in which we can live in a society where we, on the whole, get to explore what we want without coming into conflict. It seems like a very good thing to do. But as we've already pointed out there, is that not only can non-rational animals not sign up to this, mm. but they couldn't possibly consider our concerns important either. So mm. if if an animal or predator comes into my garden and wants to attack me, I can't, I can't like reason with the predator, can I? I can't be like, but what about the contract we signed? <laughs> like, it, yeah. So in which case you could see, you can see where they're approaching this from, which is just that it, it's a very different type of community that mm. we're talking about here, which is that the separating rational beings from non-rational. Well, Hobbes makes this exact point. Let's focus on Hobbes because we there's huge diversity amongst the contract theorists but in the example of you having the predator in your garden thomas hobbs says to make covenants with brute beasts is impossible because not understanding our speech they understand not <laughs> nor accept of any translation of right nor can translate any right to one another and without mutual acceptation there is no covenant i love him writing that like it was a huge insight like a covenant but they, <laughs> yeah. they can't understand us <laughs> so there's a couple of points there. We don't want to go too heavy with the analysis here because we're obviously not going to be able to do justice to the responses to all of these views, but it's worth having a little bit of critical analysis. We should keep in mind that, no, Hobbes is right. Living creatures don't have perhaps an interest in forming democratic institutions. They simply can't do that. But they certainly have an interest in not being tormented or killed. Uh, and Mary Midgley again makes this same point. And she argues that contract has its place in morality and, and not vice versa. That might be a, a really obvious response to it. And kicking the dog in the woods is, is a good example of how it doesn't do that. But what we should ask Hobbes is that I simply don't have an interest in staying alive. I've got way more interest than that. I want more from the world and from society than just staying alive. One of those things is self-governance and non-human animals might have an interest in that as well. And for Hobbes, keep in mind that he didn't think that women had to agree to the contract. He thought they were, he was happy to do it without their consent. And often we find women and uh, animals put in the same boat for a lot of these theorists. And we find these, not contracts as it were, but social relations between animals of different species all the time, how they cooperate to bring about uh, goods. And this might end up cashing out a debate between Rousseau and Hobbes in terms of what human nature is. But we don't typically need a contract between human beings for 
forming these cooperative relationships. Think about the relation between the family unit, between the parents and the children. It's not the case that there's a commercial contract between them in which your parents give you life and they expect you to do something for them, like financially or give them that support. No, the the contract is different in that what your parents do to you, you're expected to do to your children. So we have these natural social bonds already and the fabric of them isn't. And, and a, your, perhaps your a really a really short, snappy way to think about this, uh, which I, I don't have the, quite, the direct quotation from Christian Korsgaard on it, but she she says, when we ask the, that extra step of the question of why do we right, we're signing contracts because we're all self-interested we want to benefit but then you, you still have that question of why should i sign a contract right yeah. is that like so that that's the extra ethical step and then you could get into that stuff is that so there is some moral explanation for why it's good to sign the contract that then explains the rest of it and that could just be simply because we understand that uh, people are deserving of care for other reasons outside of the fact that you might get something in in return reciprocally Mm. and i think that's a an important thing to think about a huge movement linked to this somewhat it's hobbs point of language there you need to be able to speak to sign the contract and obviously we've had a huge um, explosion of interest in philosophy of language particularly over the last hundred or so years so we should i just want to briefly mention a couple of accounts because they're they're popularly cited in philosophical discussion so raymond frey's book interest and rights the case against animal rights no surprises for guessing what he argues in there (laughs) Uh, essentially his argument is that Animals can't have interests, and they can't have interests because they can't have desires and emotions. And they can't have desires and emotions because they can't have thoughts. And they can't have thoughts because they can't speak. They don't have language. And a similar view we find in Wittgenstein, and he says, quote, one can imagine an animal angry, frightened, unhappy, happy, startled, but hopeful. So I might be misunderstanding what these positions are, but it sounds as if, and this might just be my naive lack of knowledge here coming through, but to me, some of those concepts, it seems to be the reverse order, mm. that the language isn't needed to be in place for the concepts and things to arise in the first place. Surely the emotion and everything comes first, yeah. and then the concepts are born out of those things, and then language develops very late on the scene. Why language must be required to then be able to give somebody moral standing, I find very odd. Yeah, also some naive reflection. Haven't they taught sign language to certain great apes as well Mm. who can accurately identify themselves, other people, whether they're hungry or not, through language that's taught to them by a human? That doesn't mean it's their language, but they can communicate through something. Do they now have rights now? Yeah, so I'm not sure if they... I'm not sure if the Great Ape projects by by Singer and his colleagues have actually managed to secure rights for the Great Apes. I'm not sure of the situation. Maybe uh, one of you can correct me, or a listener can let us know. Or maybe I can just Google it. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> like right by me, so goddamn lazy. Um, but uh, when we asked Dennett this question, and it's he said it, we should view the idea that Great Apes no sign language or gorilla sign language. It's, it's filled with shakers of soul, and it's highly contentious whether they can or not, or whether mm-hmm. they're just it's behavior or something. So we don't need to go down that debate. I think we can simply say exactly what Andrew said like babies can feel emotions before they're able to talk Hmm. when the dog waits for its master to arrive we think it's disappointed when the master doesn't arrive but it's yet it's not capable of language and that seems to be evidence against that view and Mitchley says a theory which simply rules this mass of evidence out of existence can command little respect to suppose that speech could have originated among creatures which had no understanding no concepts no emotions no beliefs and no desires is wild but like consider my migrations, pregnancy seasons, and the constant need to anticipate the movement of, of, of predators and prey. Animals have to be able to do these things and have some very primitive thoughts about them in order to do them, right, says 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 Mitchell, given their apparatus. And take, I think the baby example is the easiest, isn't it? Yeah, like, yeah I think punch it's... Punch a baby, like, oh, it's not capable of having interests or feelings because it can't think about them because it doesn't have language. Yeah, well, I'll punch your baby. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. you see, but, okay, let's... Uh, I'll let's punch... Just, I'm going to move well, the discussion actually, slightly away the, from the baby. Wittgenstein was quite happy to punch like, his, oh, his students, wasn't uh, he? Uh, yeah, there was, I think there was something about his very short-lived uh, I don't want career as, memory, a, as a school teacher. Um, well. Yeah, I, I think we. But it's difficult to talk about um, animal intelligence in in a way that doesn't get very technical yeah. and especially because like, I cringe when I even say things like animal intelligence because there's such a spectrum and different species that you, mm. like, to talk about just animals as a whole is is too crude but I think as we've just alluded to there it seems 
quite plausible, at least from what I've read, that when when an animal observes its environment and mm. let's see sees sees what it then might have some kind of what I might call a concept of food up in that tree is mm. that they then have that response and they go for it. So if an animal has a concept but doesn't have a language to explain the concept, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have an understanding mm. of something in its environment. Now, of course, what's going on within the thought process in within that brain, I am not qualified to talk about, so I won't. You mentioned intelligence there, and that's probably one of the most popular responses, that we're justified to treat animals in the way that we do, or there's a big distinction between Homo sapiens and the rest of the animal kingdom because we're way more intelligent than they are. And I came across this quote from Thomas Jefferson, which I thought was absolutely brilliant. So he's responding to an author who'd wrote a book on the intellectual achievements of people who are racialized as black who are currently enslaved in the United States. And he says, because Sir Isaac Newton was superior to others in understanding, he was not therefore lord of the property or persons of others. That was great. If you think intelligence defines your moral value, if you're a really clever human being, you matter way more than a human being. And that's that's morally grotesque to most of us, right? If I I would I wouldn't consider someone Sir Isaac Newton to have massively immeasurably more moral worth than someone who was suffering with a mental disability. Like I think that was a that was a horrible position to to maintain. Well, I imagine lots of our listeners would agree. Yeah, the intelligence argument is incredibly flimsy. It's literally the plot of Brave New World, where they create an intelligence-based class system, and your intelligence defines where you are in that in that society. I think it's also worth saying as well that there's a lot of literature about the the idea that some people say, well, even like the most mentally challenged human being is still much more intelligent than some animals. And a lot of the research suggests that's not quite the case. As well as the fact that what even is intelligence? So the way that a bee interacts with the natural world may be may more sophisticated than we may even understand now. It might be more sophisticated than the way we interact with the natural world. Yeah, it's definitely more sophisticated than I interact with the natural world. <laughs> Because image of Jack just buzzing around. <laughs> yeah, I cannot so, do what a bee does. Yeah, so so what is intelligence? And I think that's that's a much more interesting question than just saying, oh no, we're just smarter than than chimpanzees because we can build the Eiffel Tower. Well, okay, sure, there are engineers that are very sophisticated mm. with mathematics and builders, and that does take a lot of work and effort. But is that quote more intelligent than I don't know some sort of sustainable living? I think it's up for debate. One really important feature of this approach is that people do assign moral value to intelligence and accept that animals do have some kind of intelligence. So it's not the absolutist view that says they don't matter at all. It's just that if you have more intelligence, you're more important. And there's a great quote here from Sojourner Truth, the black feminist in the US, who says, quote, if my cup won't hold but a pint and yours holds a quart, wouldn't you be mean not to let me have my little half measure full? The intelligence thing for me is one of those ones that, uh, with all the examples you just heard there, gets reduced to absurdity very quickly. Uh, because I'm sure even just on a very short little thought experiment is that if the listeners could just think of somebody who they think is very, very smart, but also very incapable at certain things. So like, there are so many types of intelligence and different ways of approaching life that that, that, that being the core aspect of, of importance doesn't make any sense at all. What I'd like to focus on now is if we've we t- talked a lot about intelligence and we, and we haven't actually mentioned Immanuel Kant and he, I, we won't go into detail with, with all of his similarities with Hume, but Kant's perhaps most famous for talking about not so much intelligence, but the importance of rationality as Mm. as a signifier for somebody's moral worth. And and why? Because he thinks that rationality is the thing that allows you to be an end in yourself. And in simple terms, what we're saying there is, is that to be rational means that you can control your impulses, you can choose a life that you want to live and that your goals in that sense then mean something more and very deep to you and you also he believes that this links into your sense of personal ownership and a sense of self that you have this i that you can speak of and that that means that you are worthy of protection and moral concern he of course thinks that animals lack this rationality and are are therefore not part of the moral community much like with some of the other thinkers though he does not mean that this is an excuse to just treat animals completely as we wish Yes. So Kant didn't argue we have direct duties to animals. He says we have indirect duties. So a quote here from his lectures on ethics from 1775, quote, so far as animals are concerned, we have no direct duties. Animals are not self-conscious and are there merely as a means to an end. This end is man. 
And briefly, what Kant means by this is that he thinks that if you are going out of your way to abuse animals and harm animals, then that is actually a reflection of your character. Mm. So if you beat up a cat or put a cat in a wheelie bin, it's not the cat being put in the bin that is bad. Yes, of course, the cat will feel some discomfort being put in the wheelie bin. Mm. But actually, it says more about you as a person. He argued that actually, if you harm animals, you torture animals, it's more likely that you're going to be going to be doing that towards people as well. Mm. So it's almost like a signifier that if you're harming animals, you're more likely to harm people. Yeah, quotation from Kant, for he who is cruel to animals becomes hard also in his dealings with men. We will get much more into the in depth on some of the Kantian deontological thinking towards duties of animals in the next episode. So I feel like it's a good place to yeah. leave it there. Well, there's lots of nuances to Kant and we'll see that it's not that blanket thing we've just given. And we're going to be looking a lot of about Kantian ethics and, and utilitarianism in next week's installments. Yeah, let, let's leave it there and we can criticize and understand those ideas and develop them a little bit further next week. So we've spoken during this section about people who don't think that animals have moral rights or people that think they've got some moral rights, but they're not important, but they're not as important as human rights. And it seems when we read these philosophers that it's almost inconsistent with their wider views, as we'll talk about as we go throughout the series and we talk about during this section as well. And I thought this quote from Mary Midgley was brilliant. She says, quote, their discussion often looks as if they had not written it themselves, but had left their paper for the afternoon to some weird secretary who wanted to discredit their <laughs> doctrines. So like, Aristotle sometimes writes like a typical Athenian of his day, human Kant similarly, and talk about uh, sex and race and treatment of animals as well. And what we find is animals find themselves within the realm of the excluded groups such as um, such as women and such as people who aren't white Europeans. And so animals get the same treatment. It's like, we, let's develop this moral philosophy, but the exceptions of my day are over here. And we'll talk a bit in next week's installment again about the comparison between racism and sexism and whether speciesism is a meaningful comparison to those. But it seems like for a lot of these cases, it's just a, a really sad instance of self-deception in which one hasn't done the, the philosophy properly or they've just left out a certain group. Um, but often, as, as we'll find again, a lot of the times these progressive movements that move towards that are right for some people don't take everybody with them at the, at the same time. And we find this constantly when we're fighting for our own equality, the people below us, um, we, we sideline in our minds as well and we just fight for what matters. Uh, to us in our own philosophy so unfortunately they, they fall victim to that but it's not true for all of the great philosophers of the world let's look towards the east and finish on a positive note before we finish this installment yeah so so far we've been talking about western philosophers and it's been pretty pretty male pretty pale pretty stale <laughs> am i right guys so let's go to the east let's have a look at let's have a look at india right so i'd really like that phrase that is quote from mr jack simes that i've completely I don't stolen think i, I heard it from someone else Did you? Stole it too, so. yeah that, that's definitely not a jack simes original <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it, it's canon in terms of like who counts morally yeah <laughs> <laughs> so if we look at india we see a very very different approach and a very rich literature and very rich history a very different approach to animal ethics and animal rights i think it's worth saying that the the most large religions in india so religions like Hinduism, religions like Buddhism, Sikhism to an extent, and Jainism, pretty much universally vegetarian and have a very different approach to animal rights. Mm. This comes down to the idea mainly of ahimsa. So this is a belief that is held as different names in these religions, but you can see it as like an overall belief that's held roughly by them all. And ahimsa is simply the idea of nonviolence, that you shouldn't harm other beings. And for lots of different reasons, obviously the, the most true one is reincarnation. So if you are going to be eating an animal, you could be eating grandma because grandma could have reincarnated into that animal. And therefore, obviously, you don't want to make that animal suffer. This creates bad karma and can not just affect you in your next reincarnation, but also causes harm and suffering to those other animals. This, this belief in him, so it's in Hinduism, very explicitly in Jainism as well. So the founder of Jainism is a guy called Mahavira, who says, quote, There is no quality of soul more subtle than nonviolence, and no virtue of spirit greater than reverence for life. Mm. And that very clearly explains the Jain worldview and the Jain approach to, to animals. This view of reincarnation, and I heard it described in similar terms when I was doing my own reading, and we find something similar in Pythagoras as well, is that, as you say, because a human soul could be in a non-human animal, we find that we have a motivation for not eating them. But 
I think for for any sensible Hindu, really, they don't see it as uh, humocentric in the sense of well, because they're human like, I shouldn't hurt them. They, they 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 have to do it for the right reasons, as we've spoken about in a recent philosophy series. You don't do it just because it's human; you do it because it's a being capable of suffering, and, and for that reason only. Yeah. So, you, like, if you visit India, you'll notice that cows are a very sacred animal in India. That literally, if a cow walks into a highway, all of the cars will stop to let the cow pass. Now, does that mean that every single Hindu in those cars thinks that there's literally a soul of their reincarnated grandmother? In? No, of course not. But it's a general rule, and like like Jack says, that absolutely the idea that 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 kind of behaviour is more appropriate towards other creatures. Bring the cows to Liverpool, they wouldn't stop them at all. The people in Liverpool don't stop their children, let alone <laughs> cattle. Ouch. <laughs> On a more positive note, <laughs> I, I uh, just I looked at a couple of examples within Jainism, uh, and I thought these some of these were quite interesting. So there's apparently there's a, a charity hospital for birds in Delhi, mm. where birds are taken and look, looked after, and if and if uh, if after all of the treatment they can't live, then they at least looked after for as long as possible until they die. Um, and then there are some of the things, I believe we mentioned this in our episode on Buddhism, mm. which is some of the other practices within Jainism. So brushing the the streets mm. to avoid stepping on any creatures that might be scuttling along below uh, and even putting things over their, their mouths or cloth to not swallow any flies and even being careful to not cook too late so mm. the bugs might be attracted into the fire okay. uh, and all of that stuff. So some really strict adherence to Jainism really take this idea of Ahimsa non-violence to its kind of maximum conclusion. Again, we shouldn't generalise and say that all people in the East or following these religions are all vegetarian or vegan. In our Confucius series, remember what Confucius <laughs> said? So Confucius and the Analects, book 10, verse 11, when the stables caught fire, the master on returning from court said, did anyone get hurt? He did not ask about the horses. <laughs> The Stick Confucians it. don't care. <laughs> well, and, and on, on that point there, by Not the way... Not to make I, generalizations. <laughs> yeah. No Confucians that, care about horses. <laughs> yeah. God, this is awful. Um, <laughs> yeah, on, on, on the point of generalizing, the... It, because even even within we were saying there about within India, look, there are many Hindus that are, are also not vegetarian. So mm. it, we talking about religious traditions like this is is always going to come up with many potholes. And even just talking about Buddhism, I think we can say that one of the most important things in Buddhism is refraining from taking life. Right, this is one of the the five precepts: not killing any living being. Mm. So for most, that includes obviously being vegetarian. The idea of karuna and metta. So for Buddhists, the idea of compassion, mindfulness. For all beings, loving kindness. It's not just about, I love you, Jack, because you're human. Oh, it's like, I love you and I love Scruffy the dog because you're both beings and I've got to love all beings. That's part of my religious duty. And I think that, that yes, we don't want to make generalizations, but if it literally says refrain from taking any life, mm. then we need to hold the Buddhist accountable to that. Yes, some Buddhists do eat meat if it's given to them, but <laughs> it's like one of the central core tenets of their religion, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. And I, I believe that's always the difference between what a sacred text or a tradition has long taught and how people enact it in the modern world there are many many people who adhere to religions where they shouldn't drink alcohol but they do drink alcohol mm. or they don't perform certain rituals or whatever it is it's it's normal human behavior it reminds me i think i told you both about this before i did a school trip to a buddhist temple in in birmingham with a class and the lady speaking to my group i taught them all about buddhism for the last like Eating two or three months <laughs> she was like <laughs> it's one of the girls asked about whether or not it was okay to eat meat and she basically told them that they have a moral responsibility to eat meat and i was like <laughs> what <laughs> don't put that in your exams please <laughs> Anyway, Midgley again here, another great quip. People in general have perhaps thought about animal welfare as they have thought about drains as a worthy but not particularly interesting subject. <laughs> but over the last 40 or 50 years in particular, there's been a huge wave of interest in, in plumbing <laughs> and drains. <laughs> I, for one. No, in the anti racial and sexual discrimination campaigns of the 20th century have, have, have moved into those of animal liberation, most notably sparked by Peter Singh's book in 1975, Animal Liberation, that we'll talk about next week as well. And lots of animal rights groups, and I'm sure you can name lots of yourself RSPCA, Peter, People for Ethical Treatment of Animals. All of these have came out of the drains themselves. As you know, this has been no way a comprehensive overview of the history of non-human animals across the history of philosophy. We've left many of them out. You're probably wondering, where's the Aristotle? Where's my place? Where are all these people who have spoken about for animal rights in the past? We're going to talk about lots of them in the series and the episodes to follow. But for now, they'll remain 
a mystery. The Mystery Philosopher. <laughs> Welcome to Mystery Philosopher. Are you excited? I am. As excited as I am as about drains. <laughs> well, uh, you are very passionate are these about these all... Uh, quotations from famous animals. <laughs> Harambe. No, yes, they are. <laughs> so, no, yes, you do have lots of quotations from famous animals, and you've got to guess which animal it is. <laughs> do you want that I, one again? Do you feel like uh, you've got it? I uh, mean, I would. I'm going to assume pig. A pig. I'm going to go. Idea. I'm going to go with gorilla. Oh. Oh, well, now it sounds like a duck. Like that's more than one animal. It's close to a. It's a, it's a type of bird. It's a, a, it's a group of them. It's not uh, like a no a goose. So if it was, was QI, <laughs> I'd say it wasn't a goose. But this is a goose. That's 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 yeah okay goose. that's de- that's definitely a goose. Yeah. So the first one is not a goose, but similar. I'll give you a clue. It's one. It's one. Blank are some of the most striking birds in the world with huge feet and massive bills. And like other birds, members of this group have all four toes of their webbed feet facing forwards. Most birds have three forwards and one backwards. It makes them really good swimmers, but they're very clumsy on land. Great big beak. Heron Exi- existed yeah, like for at a, least a, a thirty pelican? million years. It's a pelican. Well done, Andrew. <laughs> Specifically, they're baby pelicans. But <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. oh, sorry. I, I, how did I not know that? So no points. That's <laughs> <laughs> great. Worst one yet. <laughs> I'm looking forward to two, three, and four. Oh, God, pelican. <sighs> Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. Excellent. That was that great. That was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>